The following broadcast, Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, is made possible thanks in part from the support of Wilbur Hot Springs, a health sanctuary and nature preserve located in Calusa County, California. As many of you know, for half a century, Wilbur has been a place for me to rest, replenish, heal, and create. Wilbur is completely off the grid, situated in an 1,800-acre nature preserve. For over 100 years, the slogan of Wilbur Hot Springs has been, in all the world, no waters like these. This year especially, it's vital to take time to unplug, to be with prescription-grade nature, what I call R little x n, to focus on personal well-being. I suggest that unless you're in a vehicle, step away from your devices right now. Take a deep breath. Imagine Wilbur's natural medicine waters enveloping you. Visit wilburhotsprings.com and book your stay today. My guest today is Dr. Gabor Mate, medical doctor and best-selling author of four books, the most famous of which, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. We interviewed him about a, this book a, a few years ago. Stay tuned for what I'm certain will be a fascinating interview. But first, news and notes in psychology, medicine, and politics. Today, I offer you a plan for fighting the invading COVID-19 with radical kindness and neighborly love. With the most due respect for all who have been impacted by the invading COVID-19 pandemic, I am here today to offer you another perspective. Back in February of 2020, I told my wife that as this pandemic strikes, we will turn on our TVs and every day the screen will show the number of people who are infected with COVID and the number of people who have died from it. As the numbers increase daily, the fear in our country will increase. Stores and schools will close and millions will lose jobs because this president will not muster a coherent battle plan. The national fear that has now actually occurred has been driven primarily by two factors. One, a reprehensible lack of coherent presidential leadership, and two, sensational media coverage driven by the number of watchers and readers rather than by facts, science, and national policy. The president of the United States could have said, and I trust that our new president will now say, my fellow Americans, it is my duty to tell you that our country is at war. We are being invaded. We are being injured and killed. The enemy called COVID-19 is microscopic in size, but as lethal as any enemy we have encountered. I am asking every single American to join me in the fight until we eliminate the enemy. Today, as your president, I initiated the Defense Production Act and directed our manufacturers to work triple time to manufacture personal protective equipment, PPE, for every citizen. Facial masks and bottles of alcohol spray will be supplied to all citizens of the Republic. We will be issuing a national procedure for use of masks, how to socially distance, and how to contaminate hand, decontaminate hands. Due to the extra shifts required and our casualties, we will need additional workers and thus jobs will be created and not lost. When citizens get infected and have to stay home for periods of time, they will receive federally supported paid leave until certified to go back to work. Special training programs will be created so that missing workers will be immediately replaced whenever possible. Emergency training programs will be created for frontline workers, such as hospital staff, firefighters, and police, so that none of these critical forces will be short. Special procedures will be put in place so that those who must work in close proximity to others will be protected to the extent possible. Keeping everyone employed and our economy fully open will come at a cost of injury and lives. This happens in all wars, and we must be resilient and fight the good fight. It is estimated that within the first year of this war, 
we may lose as many as 350,000 citizens, but by fighting together, many war, many more will be spared. Please keep in mind, my fellow, fellow citizens, that we have three other preventable diseases that are killing even more of us each year, and yet we go on with our lives and continue to fight them. Cigarette smoking kills 480,000 of us every year. Heart disease kills 650,000 of us each year. Obesity kills 300,000 of us each year. All three of these are preventable and we shall conquer them. An unknown number of the 350,000 who this year may perish from the invading COVID-19 also have one or more of the other three major causes of death. One at a time, we will defeat the big four, but first we must defeat COVID. Our first defenses are wearing protective facial masks, keeping a reasonable distance from one another, being extremely careful when coughing, sneezing, singing, or shouting, and washing our hands often. Specifics of these prevention tactics will be presented to you on national TV, the internet, and print media. My fellow Americans, the COVID only exists by transmission. It does not live standing alone. Stop COVID's transmission and it dies. Our job is to stop COVID transmission and eliminate its ex existence. This is your president asking that each of you join me so that we may prevail. As you all know, this is not what happened. Instead of being brought together and fighting as one, the 50 states were told by the present president to fight on their own. As a consequence of this misguided directive, states competed for protective equipment and even for hospital workers. To this very day, our hospitals are short on staff and equipment. Jobs have been lost and the lower half of our socioeconomic spectrum have been hobbled. As the pandemic rages, the present sitting president plays golf and weekends in Palm Beach at his lair. For your consideration going forward, I offer another COVID fighting tactic. We can use our fear and our vulnerability to create a culture of kindness. We can be radically kind to one another in a time of war. We can be radically kind to each person we talk to, be it on the phone or the Zoom or in person at social distance. We can dig deep and think of something friendly and kind to say to one another. We can acknowledge that we are not 50 states, but one people who are all Americans. We are the descendants of those who threw off the yoke of being subjects to a king and became citizens of a new republic, the first republic in 2000 years. Our band of founders defeated the strongest army in the world and we can defeat COVID-19. Let us band together in our neighborhoods, in our local environments, with the people in our daily lives and practice radical kindness so that those we lose shall die with dignity and those who live on will do so knowing we did our very best for them as good neighbors. Let our new president lead the way to a United States of America. My guest today on Mind, Body, Health and Politics is Dr. Gabor Mate, a physician and best-selling author of four books published in 25 languages. Renowned for his expertise on addiction, trauma, childhood development, and the relationship of stress and illness, his book on addiction received the Hubert Evans Prize for Literary Nonfiction. For his groundbreaking medical work and writing, he's been awarded the Order of Canada, his country's highest civilian distinction. Today, we will be discussing his bestseller, Scattered Minds, The Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health and Politics, Dr. Mate. 
Thanks, Richard. Please call me Gabor. And just to make a distinction, the title of my ADHD book you just gave is the Canadian version. In the U.S., the same was, was same book was published as Scattered, How ADD Originates and What You Can Do About It. Same book, different titles, which is an interesting story in itself. But just for your American listeners, who most of them would be, the, t- the book is entitled Scattered. Not, Scattered. They yeah. can find it on Amazon. Yeah, well, I hope they'll find it in independent bookstores. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Fair enough. But, but yes, it's on Amazon. Gabor, people listening may have children with ADHD. They themselves may have ADHD. They want to hear from you. For you, what is ADHD? Please well, tell uh, them. Well, so it's something I was diagnosed with myself in my 50s, actually. And, um, you know, the general criteria are a number of traits falling into poor impulse control, poor attentional skills, and uh, plus or minus physical hyperactivity. So difficulty paying attention, tuning out, absent-mindedness, losing things, disorganization. And then poor impulse regulation, so acting things out, blurting things out, um, addictive behaviors, compulsive shopping, uh, just not being able to regulate your impulse as well. Um, uh, Would you call it an impulse control disorder? Well, first of all, whether I call it a disorder is another question too. But but yes, it, it does have features of poor impulse regulation. So th- there are other diagnoses with poor impulse regulation. This is one of them. And it's certainly one of the diagnostic tra- uh, characteristics according to the DSM is poor impulse regulation. So that's, so it's attentional problems, impulse regulation problems, plus or minus physical hyperactivity, fidgetiness, difficulty sitting still and so on. Should people who are listening, who have this, been told they have it or their children have it, should they accept this diagnosis as a diagnosis of pathology or do you have another way for them to look at it? Yeah, well, that's the key question. So um, the, the medical view of it, you know, the conventional medical view of it, that it uh, represents pathology. It's a disease of the brain. You know, I don't see it that way personally. Um, uh, but then again, I have a different view of mental, of what's called mental illness in general. So um, it's helpful. Like I, when I was diagnosed, or self-diagnosed and then officially diagnosed, I found that helpful because it helped to it helped to give me a handle on myself and, and 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 with a clue to some of my behaviors and emotional patterns and so on. So, contrary to some people being shocked that oh my God, now there's something wrong with me, I welcomed it. I said, okay, great. This helps to uh, help me to understand myself. And um, but. Uh, is it a, but, but, a, but it's a description more than an explanation. So here's the problem. People think, okay, so-and-so behaves this way because they have ADHD, or I am this way because I have ADHD. <coughs> but, but, but ADHD doesn't explain anything. It just describes something. In other words, it describes certain patterns of behaving and acting and, and being. It's a fair enough description of certain patterns. But to explain it and boil it down to brain pathology is to ignore science and it's to ignore human experience. Number one, number two, it's a mistake to think that just because 10 different people manifest similar behaviors, they all do so for the same reasons. So there could be a whole lot of reasons why a kid, for example, might have difficulty paying attention in the classroom. And to call it all ADHD, is to ignore the fact that the difficulty paying the attention in the classroom is just a symptom. It's not an explanation. Now we have to ask, why is this kid having trouble, difficulty paying attention in the classroom? And there could be any number of reasons for that. ADHD could be one of them, but it doesn't follow that everybody with the same behavior patterns has got the same underlying uh, explanation. 
And then those, this is, it, 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 you know, we like to categorize things. We like to kind of put things into slots and little boxes. So from that point of view, ADHD is convenient. Okay, we can put this kid or this adult into this particular box. But I think that's insufficient. And the big thing is that medicine doesn't do, and I'm sure you understand this, is that we t modern medicine tends not to ask what happens in people's lives. We just take a certain category of behaviors or emotional patterns, and then we say, this is a brain disease. Same with addiction, same with depression, same with obsessive compulsive disorder. This is a brain disease. But actually, if you look at the lives of people, you find that they might have really good reasons why they're addicted. They might have really good reasons why they have trouble paying attention or, or sitting still or having poor impulse control. And so that the diagnosis and the reducing it to pathology, to pathology that just doesn't consider the actual context in which these um, symptoms have arisen. And the other thing that medicine and psychology does for the most part is we separate the individual from the environment. So a kid is diagnosed with ADHD, we think he's got the problem. But what if his behavior patterns reflect something about the environment in which he's living? What if there are stresses and situations in the family or community that are causing him to be that way? Now, that leads to a totally different treatment approach. So to boil this down, number one, the diagnosis describes things, but it doesn't explain things. Number two, it's not an individual problem. It reflects a person's interactions with the environment. Number three, it reflects a person's life history. We can talk more about that. And furthermore, the biology of the brain itself is created in interaction with the environment so that the brain is a social organ. So which circuits develop and which do not, and which chemicals will be pre present in what quantities, which neurotransmitters will be available. That's very much a function of a person's interaction with their environment beginning in the womb. So already in the womb, stresses on the mother will start to affect the brain biology of the child. So the usual diagnosis doesn't take into account any of these factors. Gabor, please help me here. Listening to you, I don't understand how other than for perhaps insurance purposes or some other written material, I don't understand how the diagnosis helps parents or people whatsoever if what you're saying is that the diagnosis takes in a myriad of behaviors and activities, very few of which may apply to any one idiosyncratic person, although that person may have some of them. And so if you accept the diagnosis, you may be accepting a whole basket of things about yourself, only 48% of which or 23% of which may exist. So from that perspective, our listeners who they may accepting a diagnosis may be dangerous. Well, so that depends very much on how it's used. If it's used to categorize and pigeonhole a kid, it's terrible. If it's used to, uh, if, if, if it's used to explain a kid, that's terrible. But a lot of these kids, they do behave in ways that annoy adults and may disrupt the ordinary course of things in a family or in a classroom. Now, the usual response on the part of parents and teachers, school systems in this society is to blame the kid for the way they're behaving. That he's just a troubled or a troubling kid. And then we try to control their behaviors through behavior control, rewards and punishments, which are terrible. And they have a neg real negative effect. So if parents or teachers can say, okay, well, this kid has got a kind of syndrome that he's not creating deliberately. He's not behaving this way because he's a willful bad kid. Well, that 
does that can lead to a degree of compassion and understanding and curiosity. So from that point of view, it can be helpful. Are you implying that there are still people in our educational system who relate to this unusual or different, let's say different behavior, as if the kid is simply being bad? I mean, I, I'm incredulous. Are you really? Yeah. <laughs> But maybe because I live in California. No, listen. <laughs> because we live, we live in a bubble. Oh, come on. I have a daughter that worked in a school in Berkeley, a, a school for very troubled kids. And um, very often teachers were punitive towards these kids. So they, they, would, they were treating them with moralism. As if they're either moral. bad or good. Bad means is a moral is a moral judgment. Well, they would talk to them that way, you know, uh, uh, or they would treat them punitively or by separation, this kind of thing. This goes on in all the school systems. It's notorious. So yeah, uh, from that point of view, a diagnosis can soften that. But then the question is, then what? You know, so once you once you've got, I, I got no problem with the diagnosis as such although it doesn't apply to as many, nearly as many people as we think it does. But, but the question is, once a child has been identified as having certain patterns, that these patterns describe the way they behave, now then what? Then how do we understand it? And what do we do about it? And that's the real issue for me. Now, it's also, it's, it's also true, by the way, that the poorer you are, and the more on Medicaid you are, the more likely your kid is to be diagnosed with uh, ADHD because then you can uh, get into giving uh, medications to control the child's behaviors. Gabor, over 50 years ago, a friend of mine named Sidney Girard mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Transparent Self. It was a seminal book in my life. Mm -hmm. You have been extremely transparent about your own life in your writing. And I'm going to get very personal right now with regard to some of the things you've said. Yeah. You have openly talked about the fact that your own children have ADHD. A couple of them were diagnosed with it, as, as was I, yeah. And you mentioned earlier today, and you've mentioned in, at other times and in many interviews, that you yourself were diagnosed with it in your 50s. Please tell our listeners a story about your children, how they came to be diagnosed, and how you, as a physician, along with whoever else you brought in, worked with your own children. Well, so first of all, I don't have my children's permission to talk about their lives, and uh, so I'm not going to do that. Um, all right, I'll re I retract that. <laughs> I, I fully accept that. No, that's uh, a, even, even though you've read about it uh, somewhat, but I will retract. But you do have permission to talk about your own case. So, No, no, and, and I'll talk general terms about my case, but not in specific terms. Understood. Uh, yeah, so... <clears throat> so here's the deal. When in my 50s, I was um, a family physician. And I was also the medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, working with terminal ill people. And a social worker in the unit, the woman in her 30s, one morning asked me to have coffee with her. And uh, her name is Betsy Jo. And uh, she said, I've just been diagnosed with adult ADHD. And she told me all the symptoms, poor impulse control, addictive behaviors, difficulty paying attention, tuning out absent-mindedness, difficulty sitting still, I was being late for things. And I was in five minutes into the conversation. I realized why she was talking to me because I recognized myself in everything she said. So I read upon ADHD and there I was. And I could see that so were a couple of my kids. But what I never bought into was that this is a disease or it's a genetic disease. Despite the fact that my kids were diagnosed as well. And the reason I didn't buy into that is because I asked myself, well, what is tuning out? What is absent-mindedness? How does that come? How does that arise? Now, in psychological terms, if I ask you, 
what is tuning out? What function does it serve? What would you say? I would say that it's a protective device uh, to uh, spare me from hearing that which I don't want to hear because it's too painful. Exactly. So it's a, it's, it's a protective device or seeing or experiencing what you don't want to see or experience. Yes. So, 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 it's, a, so it's an adaptation. Not a disease, but it's an adaptation. And we all have the capacity for it. Well, in that, in that case, Gabor, excuse me, I beg your pardon. No, that's okay. The question is, why does it become so entrenched in some people? Okay. Then I considered my own infancy. So as a Jewish infant living on the Nazi occupation in Budapest, with a terrorized mother in fear of both of us being sent to Auschwitz for the whole first year of my life. My father was away in forced labor. My grandparents had been murdered in Auschwitz when I was four months old. My mother was grief struck, physical privation. And then at one year of age, we were separated for six years. Now, how would an infant survive such a time? Well, imagine the circumstance. And bombing raids, you know. Um, Block out as much as possible. Yeah, so you tune out as much as possible. Put up a barrier. That's the whole point. And the brain can do that. The other human brain can do that. It's an adaptation now. The brain does it every night when we sleep. If we are in a neighborhood where there are cars and sirens and machines and so on, we put up a barrier and block it out completely. And every listener to this program knows that. And we can do that uh, in a waking state as well. And yes, a lot of people do that. They don't do it deliberately. The brain does it for them. So uh, <laughs> I'm laughing think. because I don't know what you mean by they don't do it deliberately. The brain does it for them, almost as if that's an abdication of their responsibility over their brain. No, come on. As, the, as, as a six-month-old infant, do, do I decide to tune out? No, no, I was t thinking more of an adult, you know. At, at, nobody, that's, does, no, no, nobody does an adult in therapy. I've talked with people and some difficult subject comes up and all of a sudden they're gone. They're absent. They're just not there. And then, and then we say, well, what happened here? Well, that tuning out, there's some very painful memory arose for them that they didn't know how to handle at the time. So the brain just cuts out. It's an automatic mechanism, a dissociation. You know? So you're saying... It's involutional. It's involutionary. What it's, would it take for a person to take volutional control of an involutional process? Well, let's come to that in a moment, okay? Okay. But w w when I had this insight that this wasn't a disease, but a, an adaptation, there's something I didn't know, uh, a science that I didn't know, science that most doctors still don't know, not because it doesn't exist or hasn't been proven or hasn't been documented up to yin yang, but because it's not taught in the medical schools, which is how does the human brain actually develop? So it turns out that the human brain develops an interaction with the environment. This has been published in major medical journals. It's not a secret. So which circuits develop? And as I said earlier, like, like for example, in ADHD, when you, and I, I've taken medication for it. And even when I wrote my recent book, which I just finished, I'm just finishing writing it in the next couple of days. Um, occasionally, I would take dexedrine to help me focus. And uh, dexedrine, dexedrine, yeah, which is a stimulant. Um, now, what dexedrine or Ritalin or any of these Siler, you know, um, any of these um, ADHD medications do is they elevate the level of a chemical in the brain called dopamine, and dopamine is the attention focus. Uh, motivation chemical in the brain. Now, and it sometimes really helps adults and children. I'm not against them. But the point is, our dopamine circuits develop an interaction with the environment. The more stress there's in the early environment, the less dopamine you're going to have in your brain. And uh, Say that again for our listeners, please. That's important, kindly. The more stress there's in the environment, the less dopamine receptors you're going to have in your brain, the less dopamine activity. Same with serotonin. I think we want to make that connection very clear, Gabor. Yeah. The more stress in the environment, the less dopamine in the neurotransmitters, the less dopamine, the harder to focus. Exactly. Also, the less serotonin, and then you're more likely to be depressed. 
you know, so that um, you can even take adult monkeys and put them in isolation cages and their dopamine receptors will diminish over time. And then you put them back into the social company and their dopamine receptors will come back. So what I'm saying is that the brain is a social organ. Again, I'm not a scientist. I don't make this stuff up. This is just the science. So what's happening in our society and the reason we're seeing so many more diagnoses of ADHD, ADHD kids and all kinds of other so-called mental health diseases is that the parenting environment, you don't have to have war. You don't have to have the kind of privation that I experienced as an infant. All you have to have is two parents that are really stressed. Maybe they have their own trauma. Maybe they're economically stressed. Maybe they're stressed for time. They can't provide the child with that calm or tuned attention. It's not a question of do they love their kids? Are they dedicated? Of course they are. But are they stressed? And the, ch the child in a stressed environment will tend to tune out simply to protect himself from the stress. Now, if you then combine that with kids who are genetically more sensitive, they're more affected by what happens. Now you've got the condition for interfering with optimal brain development. And so what's really happening with this epidemic of childhood mental illnesses in our society, not just ADHD, is that we have a stressed society when children no longer have their developmental needs met, they're stressed, and as a result, their brains are affected, which also means that if we're going to treat them, we shouldn't just be trying to treat their brains with chemicals. We should be looking at the environment and how can we create environments in which can the brains can develop in a healthy way. That's the real issue for me. So what, what you're saying, if I understand you, is that the increased societal stress when it's focused on people who have the propensity or the environmental background or some combination of brain chemistry and environmental background to go in the direction of ADHD, that's where how the societal stress will come out in them. Some other group that have a proclivity towards something else, it'll come out more in them. And that's why perhaps we're seeing more autism, maybe more childhood schizophrenia, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're predicting, if I understand and correct me if I'm mistaken, is that we're gonna see more, an increase in all kinds of childhood difficulties and challenges as a result of the increased societal stress that's, that we're not controlling, that we're not dealing with properly. Is that correct? You summed it up admirably. Um... I don't know that anybody's born with a predisposition towards ADHD. I mean, they say it's the most heritable disorder there is. I think that's scientific nonsense for all kinds of reasons. But there seem to be a large number of genes. Like when you look at mental health disorders, everybody thinks these are genetic. So obsessive compulsive disorder is a genetic disorder. No, it isn't. Nobody's ever found a single gene that causes obsessive compulsive disorder or schizophrenia or anything else. What people have found is that there's a whole bunch of genes. This is the closest we can come to it. That is, you have them, you're more likely to have any number of disorders, but there's no specific gene for any specific disorder. I think what's really going on is we have some people who are just born more sensitive, genetically more sensitive, and they're gonna be more affected by the environment. So they're gonna react more to the environment in more, in more uh, dramatic ways. I think that's what's going on. But the key issue is still the environment. You can have two kids with the same genes, and one of them will have ADHD, and another one will not. Why? Because they were affected by different environments. So is it fair to say then that you hold the view that your children did not, the two that have ADHD, uh, did not inherit it from you, but that's something in their early environment or their right after early environment is what created this. And that it's sort of a pattern that maybe parents transmit onto their children, but not genetically, but environmentally. Environmentally and epigenetically. And epigenetically. A, which is a whole other discussion. But in the case of my kids, so they grew up in a home with a father who was a depressed workaholic unregulated ADHD um, adult with carrying severe traumas from childhood that I didn't realize I even had. I was a successful physician because I was a workaholic. 
And uh, therefore, people thought, what a great guy. He was always there for his clients, but I was not there for my family. When I was, when I was at home, I was irritable and depressed. My wife went through her stuff. We had a very conflictual marriage. Um, <clears throat> we've been married 51 years now, thank God. But in our early years, as much as we loved each other, there was a lot of tension, a lot of conflict, and our kids grew up in the midst of all that. And that's how we passed it on, not, not genetically. You bring tears to my eyes for your having the courage to say these things openly and publicly. And I truly hope that you serve as a model for more of us professionals to acknowledge the ways in which we personally have lived and the effect it's had on our own children. I yeah. thank you for that. Well, thanks for the thanks. It takes no courage on my part for a very simple reason. I'm not blaming myself. This isn't personal. This is a human experience. This applies to all of us. Here, you know? here. There's nothing special about me. Therefore, there's nothing to hide. Here, you know? here. But, but yeah. you know what I'm talking about because so much yeah, yeah. of person, yes, of course, is considered uh, the, un the unspeakable. Now, by the way, so here's, uh, I got two studies in front of me here. Um, I, uh, the studies are multiple. This came out in 2016. Family stressors and traumatic childhood experiences linked to ADHD diagnosis in children. This is 2016. I said this back in the 1990s. Um, another study, 2014, American Academy of Pediatrics. Study finds ADHD and trauma often go hand in hand. And I could go on and on and on about the brain development and so on. But let me come to a very famous example of a traumatized person with severe ADHD. You've already talked about him today. You've mentioned him. <laughs> He's the president of the United States. He's got no attention span whatsoever. Notoriously, he's got no attention span. He can't read a page. I don't think he's ever read a whole book in his whole life. And his biographers and everybody close to him talk about his absolute lack of attention. Now, look at his childhood. He was a severely traumatized individual. And a, a recent book by his niece, Mary Trump, I, I've been saying about Donald for years that every behavior that he exhibits is the manifestation of trauma, the grandiosity, the lack of attention, poor self-esteem, that he's always had to build himself up, comparing himself. More people came to my party than went to Barry Obama's party, this kind of stuff. You know, he's got no self-esteem whatsoever. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the rage. And, but but, but I'm, right now I'm talking about, the, these are all trauma imprints. But right now I'm talking about his attention span, which is zero. He came from a highly traumatized background. Now, you don't need to have that degree of trauma. Uh, you can just have really well-meaning parents who are highly stressed. And the child, if they're sensitive enough, they'll tune out. And their impulse regulation circuits will not develop the way they ought to. Because these circuits in the brain, we know where they are. They, have to, they need to have a calm, attuned parenting environment for their healthy development. And so if you look at the burgeoning diagnosis, well, genes don't change in a population uh, over 10 years or 30 years or 40 years. If we're seeing an exponential rise in something, it can't be due to genes. It's due to the environment. As you said earlier, we live in a culture that's highly, highly stressed. And that's why more and more kids are being diagnosed. And then in our wisdom, instead of trying to change the environment of these kids, we try and change the kids. We say it's their problem. It isn't their problem. They're, they're the canaries in the mine that are telling us that in our families and in our schools, there's so much stress, it's too much for these kids. And I know from personal experience, clinical experience, you change your attitude towards these kids, you start understanding their behaviors, which my books help to explain, you start getting that they're not deliberately doing this or that, you change your attitude, you change your tone of voice, you change your body language, they change within a few weeks because now they feel secure. So um, the real issue is what kind of relationships do we create with our children that help them stay healthy or if they have a problem, help them heal. That's the real issue. It's a matter of relationship. 
not a question of medical intervention and diagnosis. I want to take a small sidebar here. We have some uh, listeners who would like to ask you uh, questions. By all means. Uh, we have a uh, Sherry Davison is asking, she says, is Dr. Mate aware of TRE, trauma release exercises, and if he has an opinion about trauma release exercises being able to help people release trauma from the muscle tissue and nervous system? Well, um, I'm not specifically familiar with TRE. I'm familiar with many modalities that work with the body and release. Certainly, as Bessel van der Kolk's this trauma psychiatrist, psychiatrist book, the title implies the body keeps the score. Our traumas are stored in our bodies, not just in our brains, but in our muscles and our tissues and, 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 and throughout the body and our nervous systems, in our immune systems. That's just how it is. Scientifically, that's just how it is. So anything that can release that, so any form of body work that can release that, if TRE is one of them, yes, by all means. Now, the trouble, of course, is these are more modalities for adults than for kids. Very few kids will let you work with them that way. But if they do, terrific. Before I read the next question, I'm going to tell you a question that's come up in my discussions about your work with colleagues. And the question was about your going to medical school. Now, you explained uh, in one of your books that you were able to make it through medical school because medical school is a series of short uh, topics rather than a prolonged one. But that really doesn't, doesn't answer the question fully. And we need a, a fuller answer for, for two reasons. One, to understand how you personally did it. But more importantly, you're a model of a person who has ADHD diagnosed and you made it through medical school, which says to people who have this diagnosis in our country and around the world that you too can make it to medical school. So please talk to us about that. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't know if I ever gave the explanation that you cited, but I can tell you what happened. <laughs> well, all, all, all my life, I've wanted to be a doctor. I grew up. I want, never wanted to be anything else. And that may have been somehow a legacy of my grandfather, who was a doctor who was killed in Auschwitz, my, my, my mother's father. But for whatever reason, I grew up all my life having the intention of be, becoming a physician. However, when it comes to studying science courses, that required ongoing, steady, hard work, regular attention. That wasn't in me to do that. Whereas English and history, broad subjects, that's where mine gravitated. And I could cram all night and read five Shakespeare plays in a night and then get through an exam at the last minute and not do brilliantly, but enough to do well enough. You couldn't do that in organic chemistry. You couldn't do that in calculus. You couldn't do that in, uh, in, in inorganic chemistry. So basically, I did not go to medical school right away. I, I got this very soft Bachelor of Arts degree. I spent most of the time out of the classroom in other activities. I would cram at the last minute and I get these good marks because I'm smart enough to do that. So that's the you first. Mean because you have a memory within the HD, ADHD, which have, is powerful enough, correct? Well, listen, I'm bright enough. I'm bright enough, you know, um, but, uh, but I'm not bright enough to do well in organic chemistry if I don't study it, you know? So, but how did you study? The question is... I, oh, well, ADHD, how people, ADHD people do everything at the last minute. So I could cram at the last minute. And what I'm saying is that... that but how do you cram organic chemistry? I took organic you, chemistry. Well, you don't. That's the whole point. That's why I didn't become a doctor right away. But eventually you got through organic chemistry. Tell us how you did it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So originally, I did not become a doctor. I gave up my ambition altogether to become a physician. And then I became a high school teacher instead. Um, <clears throat> and I, got, I had a degree in English and history. And then inside of me, there was always a voice saying, yeah, you want to be a doctor, don't you? And after three years of teaching, I finally listened to the voice. So by that time, I was in my mid-20s, or late 20s. 
I was much more motivated and I was more mature. And then I started taking the science courses. And let me tell you, it was breakneck work for me. I really worked hard for the first time in my life. So the point is, if I had, if it, people with ADHD, if they, have the, if they have the motivation, they can do something. It's really a question of motivation very often. It's also a question of degree. Like ADHD, like, like there's depression. There's depression such as mild depression. Then there's suicidal depression. The same, the same with ADHD. There's a whole range of severity, right? So I didn't have the most severe kind. And I don't, say, I don't say I did. It was present enough to create problems in my life. So by the time I came back to going to medical school, I had the motivation. And I was really desperate to get into medical school and to make it through medical school. And so I really forced myself to really work really, really hard. But let me tell you, it was much harder for me than for my classmates. And believe me, before every exam, I would still be up all night cramming, but I'd, I'd worked hard throughout. So the cramming paid off. So I spent many nights drinking coffee all night and studying and walking into the exam, still flashing study cards. My classmates would go skiing the night before the, the day before the exam. I'd be up all night studying. So I did it. And in the first couple of years of medical school, when it was all about the basic sciences, I was in the bottom half of my class because I had all these science brains, these whiz kids I was competing against. The, the closer it came to working with clients and using my people skills, the higher, higher I moved up in the class. But the point is, I made it through by dint of extreme motivation and really, really hard work. Despite For those who are listening right now, Gabor, and have aspirations to go on in their yeah. education, yeah. are there medicines that you would recommend that they use in order to facilitate their studying? And if so, are you willing to say what they are? Well, yeah. So the first question is, <clears throat> and by, by the way, you know what's interesting is <clears throat> long before I knew anything about ADHD, uh, and I was actually uh, an undergraduate, not in medical school, I used to deliver f drugs for a drugstore I, as a delivery boy, you know, I, as a part-time job. And every once in a while, when I had to cram, I'd say to the pharmacist, is this something you can give me to help me focus and stay awake? Mm -hmm. and, he'd give me and he'd give me Benzedrine, mm -hmm. which, which was in those days sold as a weight loss drug. That's right. But it's a stimulant. It's mm -hmm. like, like Ritalin or Dexedrine. It elevates mm -hmm. dopamine levels. And unbeknownst to me, I was self-medicating with Benzedrine, even back in those days. Now, the first question I would say to people who've got ambitions to study is, first of all, really question yourself. Are you really motivated to, do, motivated to do this? Are you doing this because you think you should, in which case don't do it? Or are you doing it because it's really in you, because this is your heart's desire? That's the first question I would ask them. If it is, and then I'd say, there's lots of other things you need to do to take care of yourself, to help your ADHD. Are you exercising? Are you... Do you have any practices to promote self-awareness like, like, like meditation, which is hard for people, or yoga? If you can't sit still to meditate, can you do yoga? Are you eating well? Are you putting the right substances into your body? Are you going to bed on time? Are you spending a lot of time in front of screens, which, which makes the mind crazy? In other words, if you have a strong desire to do something, create the life that will support your intention. Now, on top of that, if you have difficulty concentrating, by all means, you can find medications, but they should not be the first thing. These other things should be first. And then on top of that, yeah, there's, there's methylphenidate and its various forms, Ritalin is one of them, or dextroamphetamine or dextrodine or Adderall, which other, you know, you can try them. Uh, you can try them slowly uh, under expert supervision, and you don't have to use them all the time either. You can just use them when you need to. So yes, I got nothing against that. What I'm against is telling people that they got this disease that they have to medicate for the rest of their lives. When I was uh, specializing in chemical dependence, which I did for about 10 years, yes, many of the 
people that I treated for cocaine dependence, a, a, a noticeable percentage of them had used Ritalin as children. Yeah. And they found that the cocaine gave them a similar effect with yeah. regard to focusing. So that's an excellent point. It, 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 first of all, statistically, this has been done. If you look at stimulant addicts, about 30% of them will, will have qualified to diagnose of ADHD. You know what they're doing? They're self-medicating. Because cocaine is a stimulant. Just like Ritalin and Dexedine, it elevates dopamine levels temporarily. So when I, when I worked with a highly addicted population, and I talk about this in my book, In the Realm of Undergoes and Addiction, uh, every once in a while, somebody would say to me, hey, doc, I don't get it. But other people, they, you know, they do cocaine or, or, or crystal meth, and they go crazy. Me, I calm down and I clean my room. <laughs> and I said, hey, buddy, you just handed me the diagnosis on the, on the silver platter, you know? Mm -hmm. And so people, for all kinds of reasons, people with uh, ADHD are more likely to become addicted, not just, not just to stimulants, by the way, also to gambling, also to cigarettes, also to caffeine, because all of these modalities elevate dopamine levels and they feel better on it. So that very often addictions begin as self-medications. And uh, yes, cocaine specifically is a stimulant um, like, like Ritalin or Dexedine. As a matter of fact, I sometimes treated cocaine addicts with Ritalin or Dexedine. As we know, uh, which, by, from, which, 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 by the way, can themselves become addicted. So you have to be careful. That's exactly where I was headed next, because as we know, Freud was very, uh, as, as originally an ophthalmologist, he, he, he was involved, got involved with cocaine early on, but he and his associates also learned fairly quickly, uh, not very quickly, but fairly quickly, that the, uh, uh, what is referred to as side effects which I call unwanted complications of medicine, was so severe that they backed off the use of cocaine. Uh, one of the things we know, you and I know, and everyone who treats people that use cocaine uh, know, is that uh, one of the uh, unwanted complications is a post-high depression. Uh, what can you tell us about post-use depression with the medicines that are used for ADHD? Well, again, uh, <clears throat> my main point is that the medicine should never be the only approach. And uh, <clears throat> in the case of children, they should almost never be the first approach. Whether with adults or kids, we got to look at the environment. And so my book is really clear on that. And I've been told by many, many parents that having read the book, their kids changed within a few weeks. It's that simple because children just thrive off the environment or they suffer from it. No, Before you mentioned, <laughs> the, you mentioned the parents yeah. and I, please tell us how do you work with parents who hear what you're saying as being blamed as blame since the, it's the environment that did this. And since you're the parents creating the environment, it's your fault. How do you how do you work with them around that issue? Well, in a number of ways. First of all, one of the reasons I talk about myself uh, as a parent is, is to make clear that I'm not blaming anybody. I'm you know if I'm blaming you, I'm blaming myself. But I'm not right. blaming. You, but I'm not blaming myself. I did my best as a parent. I was a great parent as best as I could be, but my best was limited by my own stuff and the stresses that I was under. And it's also multi-generational. Like a lot of parents carry unresolved issues into their parenting from their own childhoods. Are we gonna blame the grandparents? Well, then you go back to the great grandparents and so on until we're back blaming Adam and Eve or, or, or some a plaque ancestors hanging from a tree. There's no blame here. Everybody does their best. It's a question of not bad parenting, but stressed parenting. And in our society with uh, with the tremendous inequalities that you've talked about on your program, with the um, constant uh, fear mongering that goes on in this culture, with the increased isolation of people, with the breakup of communities, 
with the destruction or the erosion of extended families, parents are just not getting the support that they need. I'm not blaming parents. I'm saying we live in an insane culture. In fact, my next book, which I just finished in writing, is called The Myth of Normal, Illness and Health and an Insane Culture. So nobody should hear what I'm saying is blaming parents. I'm granting that parents do their best, but I'm saying that that best is constrained by the social environment and by the multi-generational history that those parents came from. And that was the situation in my case. There's no blame here. As we go from the apes to the present, somewhere along the line, someone has to break the evolutionary link, be it an environmental link or possibly even the genetic link, which might be broken through epigenetics that you referred to earlier. Is this a time in history, Gabor, when people can start breaking those links and, and somehow stop this ongoing passing down of trauma, trauma, trauma? Well, so breaking the link is a good way to put it. I often talk about breaking the link of, of, of trauma transmission, and that's the whole point. But be, before we can break something or deal with it, we have to be aware of it in ourselves and in our society and in, in, in our communities and so on. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, if you look at human history and human evolution, and I think it was about 500... I don't know how many million years ago uh, our ancestors first appeared on the earth, but certainly I think there have been humanoid creatures for about half a million years. And our own species, Homo sapiens, has been here for about maybe about 150,000 years or so, give or take. Now, for most of that time, for all those hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors, including our own species until very recently lived in small hunter-gatherer groups where parents were part of a group, parenting was a group activity, children were held by parents, they didn't sleep in separate facilities, they were held all the time by one parent or another adult or an older child, uh, where kids were basically not hit, according to the research in, in, in small band, band hunter-gatherer groups, where there was multiple playmates of different ages and where people, when kids were always with their parents. That changed only about 12 to 15,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture. And so that basically, and, and, and it's become accelerated since under industrialization and specifically in the hyper-capitalist late 19th and early, uh, late 20th and early 21st centuries, breakup of community, isolation of families, the breakup of even a nuclear family. These are very stressed circumstances, both parents having to be out of the home, kids don't see their parents the whole day. This is unnatural from the point of view of human development. So we have to be aware of the impacts of all this. And rather than blaming the kids and think they have pathology, we have to compensate. And we compensate by dealing with our trauma, by giving the kids the connection they need, by, by nurturing in a more of a communal sense, by making the schools a second home rather than an institution of education only. All kinds of things we could do, but we have to be aware. And the problem in our society is the lack of awareness of the impact of this culture on the developing human being. We have a caller. I don't know if we can get the caller directly on the line, but I think you're going to find this interesting. Charlie, can you get this caller right on? Um, well, I'll Hello. tell you what he's... Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. This is a lawyer, uh, Gabor, who wants to tell us something about a new law in California. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. The, recently, uh, the uh, head of the Court of Appeal... Uh, Anthony uh, said, uh, it's too bad the judges are afraid to reply. What happens now since 2018 is a law that says that if a person has a mental disorder, such as ADHD or bipolar, uh, and it's a material part reason for their having committed the crime, and <clears throat> that uh, uh, if they're willing to, to go through a program, a diversion program, and that they would qualify for that, and that they could 
handle a diversion program. So a lot of judges have it, basically, so it doesn't matter what crime it is, as long as it's not murder. So in my case, here's the, this sort of case sort of summarizes what you've been talking about. It's someone with ADHD, but also something you haven't really talked about. It was a comor comorbidity. When you have ADHD comorbid comorbidity with, uh, for example, in this case, bipolar, it creates a whole other condition. But at any rate, so he had both, but mainly they were attributing his activity to ADHD. What happened was he was, very briefly, he was a um, kid that was 18 years old. He had, had bipolar uh, ADHD diagnosed since he was uh, six. He was, uh, he was uh, on uh, federal relief. Uh, he's recognized uh, illness. And um, he, when he was in school, he moved to a new neighborhood in high school and got involved with gangs. So for two years, he was involved with gangs. And then his mother saw it was just not happening for him. It, it was not good for him. Uh, and he, she moved. But after she moved, he was still being pestered by the opposing gang. The gang was so violent that he killed one of his best friends. So he was, uh, he, he was always concerned about it. And the mother even gave him a rifle to put in his car to keep with him in case he was ever threatened. Uh, and in fact, he, he was visiting his girlfriend uh, and he suddenly saw coming at him a gang member from the opposing gang. And he thought he had a gun. So he reached back, pulled out the rifle and shot seven, eight times at the car and uh, wounded the driver. And uh, so the issue was whether or not ADHD contributed to this behavior. And so uh, we had a doctor who had treated him since he was a child, pediatrician. And she said that it did. It was a material factor in his having reacted that way because ADHD people react impulsively. To, especially when threatened. Uh, so you must never threaten a person with ADHD because you don't know how they're going to act impulsively in, re in reaction. So it, it, very, these cases are not, judges don't like to do it because judges get elected in California and, and if they are seen to be soft on crime, then that could hurt them. That's what I think. But in any event, they haven't been allowing these things. Usually it stops at the issue of material factor. Uh, and uh, you can't use things like depression. All that has to be a real class one type of mental illness. Uh, so, so we, I was able to prove everything except the last thing is the judge says, look, this is an attempted uh, murder. And uh, uh, he had a gun in his car and he, and he, and he fled afterward. And uh, of course he's fleeing is of course is, is part of the ADHD, ADHD reaction as well. But at any rate, it, so he, and and, we, and be, I think that there can't be a program in which he wouldn't be violent, and so I'm going to deny the diversion. Okay, uh, good boy, you've heard this. Uh, yeah. How does that sound to you about uh, the law taking this uh, view on uh, on ADHD? Well, first of all, if you look at the statistics, uh, people with ADHD are represented in the jail population at much higher proportion than their the section than their proportion in the population. So more, more generally, people in prisons uh, tend to have much higher rates of mental illness than, or in general than, than the rest of the population, which means basically that we're, ja that we're jailing the mentally challenged people in our society. More broadly speaking, well, with this kid that this lawyer uh, described, and in general, what we're talking about are traumatized people so that most people in our jails are traumatized individuals who come from difficult backgrounds, who then start acting out that difficulty, like, like, like joining a gang, for example, what is that about? Why do you join somebody? You join them because you're looking for companionship and connection. Why do you need that? Because you don't have it with the adults in your lives. So these gang members, are, and, and there's another book of mine called Hold On To Your Kids, that, that where we talk about this dynamic of in our society, children are very much drawn into the peer group precisely because they're looking for connection and they're lacking it with the adults in their lives. And so what you have here, if I, if I really looked at the childhood history of this 
young person that our lawyer friend has just described, I'm sure what I'd find is significant degrees of early childhood trauma that has never been addressed, never been treated. And they, these are the people that we're jailing. So whether it's ADHD or some other form of uh, traumatic enactment, these are the people that end up uh, behaving impulsively and then end up uh, in our uh, foster care system, uh, which is a setup for jail, by the way, statistically, and um, end up in the, in, the, in, the, in the youth facilities and then up in jails. So, and, and like most physicians are totally trauma uninformed, even though in California, now you have a, a Surgeon General um, who's very interested in trauma, Nadine Burke Harris. So she's doing some pioneering work there. But in general, physicians are not aware of uh, trauma and its various forms of which ADHD is one. Uh, they're not aware of, uh, of uh, how the brain develops. And of course, legal professions are not informed about all this. And lawyers and judges know nothing about this. And what they don't realize is that all these people that they're dealing with are traumatized individuals who, if they behave in certain ways, of course you have to protect society, but who really need a lot of compassionate treatment, which is the last thing they get in the prisons. Yes. So that, that's, that's my broad comment. Gabor, we're, uh, I've been told that we're running out of time. I have enough questions for at least another program, if not two more. I really wanted to talk to you about Carl Rogers because he was my, my first mentor and the whole concept of unconditional positive regard, but we're gonna have to save that. But yeah. what I would like to uh, use the re remaining time for is the connection between ADHD and the COVID pandemic. I'd like you to talk about what it's like for ADHD people wearing masks, what it's like for them dealing with virtual classrooms. We have a, one of our listeners wrote, how do you think children with ADHD are coping with virtual classrooms? I'm wondering how they are wearing masks. What's it like for them having to wash their hands so often? What's it like for them having to do social distancing? Give us some of your thoughts on that uh, in the remaining time, please. Well, I can only give you general guesses and impressions because I haven't studied the question. But, Fair uh, enough. But, um, and I don't know that this has been studied yet, although I'm sure it will be. <clears throat> but what I do know as a general fact is that under the impact of COVID, all kinds of acting out behaviors have gone up. So there's more domestic violence. There's more uh, alcohol use. There's more drug use. There's more depression. Um, there's more anxiety. So it would, seems to me only to be expected that, no, like, like, let me put it this way. If I were to stress you severely, you might have trouble paying attention, even if ADHD or not, right? Understood. Right, definitely. So, so insofar as COVID provides, a, and, and the same with ADHD kids, in some environments, they can function very well. When they are stressed, they don't function so well. So the question is, how much stress is COVID uh, imposing on their families and how are those families coping with the stress? Now, in an interesting sense, COVID could be a good thing if the, if the parents handle it right, because now you have an opportunity to be with your kid a lot, give them all kinds of attention, really get to hold them and love them and guide them and be with them. Difficult as that might be sometimes. And my book would actually help you do that. But uh, for, for those families where the being alone or being at home creates more connection and uh, more attunement with the child, this could, not, this could be not a bad thing. In, the, in those situations where that's lacking, I think it's gonna make it very tough for kids. And the, the, the parents are stressed they're more stressed, they're isolated from their usual uh, activities where they can maybe resolve some of their tensions and stresses. So this could be very hard on them. So I think it could go both ways. What did you think about my uh, opening monologue when I talked about radical kindness? <laughs> Does it have a chance? 
you know, um, in this society, we have a, a myth about human nature, that it's aggressive and uh, competitive and every man for himself, dog eat dog, that's human nature. But that's a nice story that perfectly aligns with the needs of a capitalist system, where it's all about the powerful eating up the weak and, and so on. But it's not scientific. It's got nothing to do with the truth. The truth is that connection and compassion and kindness is far closer to our evolution in nature. And that's for a very simple reason. Only through cooperation and kindness could we have survived because we're social animals. So, yeah, I think it has a chance, but I think we have to look at what culturally and institutionally and socially is in the way of that. And that's why I wrote my book, The Myth of Normal, Illness and Health in an Insane Culture. This culture is insane precisely because it goes contrary to the needs of human nature of which kindness is one. And you know what? Even laboratory animals like rats are shown to have compassion. Like they will often give up something pleasurable for the sake of rescuing another rat in a laboratory. That's not because they're consciously kind, but because they're mammals and they're social animals. And so that's wired into them. Cooperation so, and kindness are yeah. wired into us. Yeah, and yes it is. And by the way, any listener who doubts it, ask yourself, when you've had a rage episode or you put somebody down or you, you, you've been aggressive or selfish, grabbing things for yourself, how do you feel inside as compared to when you've been kind to somebody? Which is the more natural, easier, pleasurable state to be in? The vast majority of people, unless we, they've really been traumatized to the extreme, will say, oh yeah, when I've connected, when I've been kind, that's what feels really good. Why? Because that suits your nature. That's a perfect place for us to conclude our interview. Thank you very much, Gabor, for being with us today. And I hope you'll come back many times. I've got a lot of questions and a lot of things to discuss with you. Well, it's my, uh, thank you. May, 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 I, may I just add? Yes. That, that, that for those people that want to check out my work, I have a website just with my name on it. Oh, good. www.drgabbermatia.com. And also, for no cost at all, <laughs> I have dozens of my talks have been filmed and um, um, put on YouTube. So if you want to check out my views on ADHD, addiction, health, illness, chronic illness, society, whatever, if it's of interest to you, you just have to Google my name, put it into YouTube, and you'll get lots of um, opportunities to get deeper into my work. Thank you. That's www.drgaburmate.com. And thank you all for joining me for today's broadcast of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, with a special thanks to my producer, Charlie Deist, who makes this broadcast possible. The preceding program was brought to you by Wilbur Hot Springs and Thanksgiving Coffee. You know, the autumn season is magnificent at Wilbur Hot Springs. It's a wonderful place to get away and revitalize. I know you'll enjoy taking the waters as I do and hiking in the 1,800-acre nature preserve. At Wilbur, you'll find plenty of lodging options, from camping platforms to cozy private rooms. Wilbur truly is a health sanctuary. Book a visit today at wilburhotsprings.com. Here, on our little J&R farm in Mendocino County, my wife and I are producing the world's best organic eggs, if I may say so. Our chickens live a life of love, and eat the finest food, both free range and organic. Our J&R farm eggs are so excellent that we're able to trade them for the world's best gourmet coffee from the Thanksgiving Coffee Company. When I drink coffee, I only drink Thanksgiving coffee because it is the best and because the founder of Thanksgiving Coffee, Paul Katzif, is a social worker and a political activist who has improved the lives of millions of coffee growers around the world. Paul and I have mutual admiration. He appreciates and supports my broadcast, Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, and has created three special Mind, Body, Health, and Politics coffee blends. 
Then Paul doubles down and donates 20% of internet sales of these three special mind, body, health, and politics blends to the COVID Response Network, a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to protect California's North Coast from COVID. Go to the Thanksgiving Coffee Company website, buy mind, body, health, and politics coffee. Support this truth-telling broadcast, mind, body, health, and politics, and support fighting COVID. Buy it now. Please join me next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for our next stimulating broadcast. Until then, this is Dr. Richard Lewis Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for, and it is essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.